Good afternoon here in Berlin. Uh, good morning to New York or wherever you're watching us. My name is Caroline Imke and let me welcome you warmly to um, the first panel and the opening of our uh, transatlantic conversations on neo-fascism. Uh, I'm very, very excited uh, to be able to be here on the theatre uh, stage, the Globe uh, Theatre of the Schaubühne. Uh, I'm very excited that you are here uh, and watching, and uh, evidently uh, I greet everyone uh, on the web who's watching too. Um, let me uh, first of all uh, hand over to Daniel Mandelson, um, who actually initiated uh, these conversations, whose idea it was, uh, and with whom I'm cooperating uh, on this uh, uh, transatlantic conversations. Um, I hope Daniel is there. Can we see and hear him? I'm, I'm here. There you are. Here I am. Good. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all is good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Caroline, and uh, uh, welcome to everybody. I'm, I'm happy to introduce this event, and I I'm going to introduce it with a poignant remark, uh, which I shared with Caroline the other day when we were talking as we were setting up this event. I was speaking to my 91-year-old mother the other day, who's avidly following world events for many years, and she said, I was born in the 1930s, and it looks like I'm going to die in the 1930s. And I, it, it made a great impression on me, and it went to the heart of the event that Carlene and I have been so excited to bring together today. I think we all know that in the past decade, there's been a striking ri rise throughout the world of cynically demagogic, explicitly anti-democratic right-wing movements in a way that's really unparalleled uh, since the Second World War and the decade that led up to it. M major national elections, as we know, Poland, Hungary, Great Britain, and the United States have placed in power regimes and governments whose agendas flagrantly and systematically challenge and violate norms of the orders that have been in place for many decades. In those and other countries, outspokenly white supremacist and anti-Semitic, anti-democratic parties and candidates have been enjoying unparalleled successes in ways I think that would have been unimaginable even 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, I think of even ostensibly minor uh, events uh, and characters such as our own uh, Carolina Congressman Madison Cawthorn, who openly expresses his admiration for Adolf Hitler and on his social media. Um, these remarkable shifts, uh, which we've been witnessing, are marked equally and I think interestingly by uh, resistance quite often on the parts of electorates to acknowledge the nature of these very alarming developments. And that resistance is one of the things that we'll be talking about in this first panel today. Uh, so with those things in mind, I approached Caroline uh, maybe a year ago about starting a series of conversations about this crisis uh, in global politics, uh, one that would share perspectives from different countries on both sides of the Atlantic. And, um, and so that's why we have come together this weekend. Uh, as you know, uh, there will be four panels, uh, each treating a different aspect uh, as we see it of, of the crisis. Uh, the first of these panels is specifically about the issue I just mentioned, uh, which is the resistance uh, on the part of both electorates and I think media as well in a very significant way to acknowledge the nature of the problem that we're seeing. Uh, when do we get to call fascism fascism? Uh, I'm going to introduce two of our speakers today, uh, Timothy Garten Ash and Masha, Get Masha Gessen, uh, and Caroline will introduce our counterparts in Berlin. Uh, Timothy Garten-Ash is a professor of European studies in the University of Oxford. 
the Isaiah Berlin Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution in Stanford University. He's been a contributor to the New York Review since 1995, uh, and his column on international affairs in The Guardian is widely syndicated in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Masha Gessen is a contributor as well to the New York Review of Books and a staff writer for The New Yorker. She's uh, there the author of 11 books, including Surviving Autocracy, very much to the point of our conversation today, and The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, which won the National Book Award here in the United States. They have written about Russia, autocracy, LGBT rights, Putin, and Trump, for the New York Review of Books and the New York Times. Um, yeah, let me take over to introduce my two guests here in Berlin. Let me start to my left. Uh, Stefanie schuler springorum is the director of the Center for the Study of Antisemitism, Zentrum für Antisemitismusforschung of the Technical University in Berlin. She has done extensive research on the history of Jewish life in Germany and is involved in numerous projects to convey and commemorate this history. Uh, Michel Divyoka is a sociologist and professor at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris. His research focuses on antisemitism and the recent rise of right-wing anti-republican movement in France. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, and let me also say thanks uh, once to the New York Review of Books and Daniel Mendelssohn. Uh, and to the Schaubühne uh, for making this possible, and thanks to the Bildungsagenda NS Unrecht, die gefördert wird von der Stiftung Erinnerung, Verantwortung, Zukunft und dem Bin Bundesministerium für Finanzen. Uh, these are the foundations and the projects that make this uh, whole event and this whole weekend uh, possible. Um, having said that, let's get right into uh, the beef. Um, I would like to start with um, sort of a terminological analysis or an analysis of um, actually, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about fascism? And maybe let me start with Timothy. Um, there have been different theoretical approaches to understand fascism, structural analysis, psychological analysis, Marxist analysis. So. How would you define fascism? Uh, would you define it as an ideology? Would you define it as a movement? Would you describe it as a political order? Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. It's a great pleasure to be with you um, from Oxford, which I'm glad to say is still on the European side of the Atlantic, although <laughs> Boris Johnson would like it to be the other side. Um, uh, well, certainly I'm on the European side of the Atlantic. Um, I, I'm so glad you started with that question, because I have to say, I think the title for this session is magnificently circular. If you say, when do we start calling fascism by its name? Well, obviously, when it's fascism. When do we call a spade a spade? When it's a spade. But that begs the question, number one, what is a spade? Number two, is this a spade? Mm. I think myself, I want to argue that's the wrong place to start. So let me explain why. Most unproblematically, fascism is clearly a term used about and used by self-description, a whole bunch of uh, movements and regimes starting in Europe after the First World War, Italy, Germany, Spain, Romania, elsewhere, and continuing until, let's remind ourselves, in its final days, the early 1970s. Franco died in 1975. But even that group of movements and regimes is ill-defined, right? Umberto Eco, in a wonderful essay in the New York Review, called it a fuzzy totalitarianism, a beehive of contradictions. Mm -hmm. Now, then add on to that, Caroline, all the theoretical debate you're mentioning, which in German alone would fill several libraries. Someone wonderfully said, fascism suffers from an excess of definition. <laughs> and that's in, an excess of definition. Then add on to that, the last 10 years 
where people like uh, Jason Stanley, the Yale philosopher, or Paul Mason, the campaigner and journalist, have been trying to apply the term fascism to the phenomena that Daniel started talking about. And that adds a further layer of definitional complexity. So my own view is that actually the way to start, I mean, call me a pedestrian Anglo-Saxon empiricist, if you will, but the way to start is not to start by trying to find a definition and then say, does Trump or Putin or Viktor Orban or Kaczynski or AfD measure up to it? But the other way around, I would start by looking at all those movements of our time and then saying, how does the history of fascism help us to think about them, to understand them? Because clearly they have fascist elements, fascist traits, fascist tropes. And there, I think, thinking about fascism is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, can I, can I take that from Timothy and ask Stephanie, um, how useful is the terminology of fascism as a tool to analyze? And would you agree with Timothy that it's almost too complex to define it at all? Well, if you ask historians to, to define something, then you will always get the answer. It's too complex and you have a hundred definitions and so on. And so in this sense, I absolutely agree with Timothy that it's, it's very helpful to look at the historical fascism and to look at the different characteristics and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, of this phenomenon and then to, to see what is going on today and to, to see parallel similarities and dissimilarities. But I think it would broaden our, in order to like broaden our vision and get a little bit away from these interwar years, which is where fascism was fascism with all its destructive force, which is, I think, the reason why we are always inhibited of using the word today. I think it, it, I, I very much like the vision or the ideas of uh, the late Zev Sternhell, the Israeli historian, one of the eminent historians on the history of fascism. And he, I think two or three years ago, he was in Berlin, shortly before his death, um, giving a talk about the return of European fascism. Of course, everybody was okay. <laughs> That's what he thinks. But then in his um, explanation or in his perspective, he goes far beyond the interwar years. He says that fascism is kind of the core that came to power in the 1920s and 30s, but it's a part of a movement which is basically from the 19th century, which is the counter-enlightenment movement, which is directed against all the essential values um, that were developed during the enlightenment, like equality, um, uh, fraternity, <laughs> of course, um, rationality, human rights, etc. So, you know, so it, already in the 19th century, he can trace this movement of things that we want to go against it, against equality for minorities, equality for women, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So, in his perspective, the movement of what then was called fascism in the interwar years and had certain very specific characteristics, especially when it came to power, what the you know, the roots are in the 19th century, which also means it didn't stop in 45. In 45, we had military victory, fascism was defeated in various countries except for Spain, but in Spain, the United States and later the Federal Republic helped the Franco regime in order to transform itself into a clerical military dictatorship, some or half military dictatorship, sort of the fascist roots of Spanish fascism were less important and after the Second World War. So he died in his bed. He didn't have to be defeated because the regime changed. Could I, could I take that up? So first of all, if we look at the 19th century, um, you would say it's uh, anti-enlightenment is, is, is one of the strong features or against all the ideas of the enlightenment. Yeah. Um, now, if we look at... Uh, the 20th century, uh, you said it also had certain uh, characteristics, uh, evidently in different countries, diff you know, differently, but could you name some of those characteristics that you would uh, assign to this historic form? Yeah. Well, so first of all, I think there's a self stylization of victimhood, of decline, of um, defeat, which of course made sense in some countries after, after 1918, and then the vision of salvation and redemption by 
of course, nationalist, national and folkish unity <coughs> at the one hand and purity towards the inside. So in order to achieve both <coughs> unity and purity, what is needed is a very clear-cut image of the enemy, the enemy inside and also the exterior enemy. So this, I think it was Robert Paxton who called it political energy, um, you know, served to create a mass movement which then came to power destroyed democracies and installed a regime which was characterized again by, by putting this into practice, which was violence against the internal enemy, be it Bolshevism, the Jews, be it the homosexuals in Germany, for example, and then tending towards expansion as did the Italians, especially in, in Africa and in, you know, in their colonial endeavors in Africa and wars, but also against Yugoslavia. So, and then of course the Germany was the Second World War and, uh, and the Holocaust. So um, this is like in, in, in those historians who have tried to, to put this into a kind of, like this history of fascism in the interwar times in a kind of order, in a systematic order, they speak of different phases. You know, that this is a movement, first it's an intellectual idea, then a movement, then a regime, with the, always with the help of the traditional elites. Without the help of the traditional elites, fascism did not come to power anywhere. And then when it, once it is in power, the, the tendency towards destruction, inward and outward. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to see that it can also change backward, as in the Spanish case. You know, once it's not defeated, there is, it doesn't have to stay in this. Uh, Daniel, if I may have one more question to, we need to coordinate the, uh, who, who's allowed to ask the question. So can I, can I have one more uh, to Michelle and then... then um, you may, um, you Michelle, may. How, if, if we stay for, for, for a moment in that historic uh, sort of key phase uh, of different mm -hmm types of fascism, how central was anti-Semitism to that fascism? Well, it depends if we deal with Italian fascism or with Nazism. And this is why uh, I think we must be very careful when we use the word fascism. It, at the, the, the very beginning, historically, it's Italian. It's fasci. It's not Nazism. Then, could it become a kind of family name for Mm -hmm. Japan, Germany, Italy at that time. This is not totally sure. That's my first mm -hmm. point. So if you want to deal with anti-Semitism, it is clear that Italy was much less anti-Semitic in this movement than uh, uh, Germany. This is absolute, absolutely clear. So this is my first point. Now to, 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 to make another step in, your question, in the answer to your, uh, to your question we must be very careful with anachronism. That is to say, using categories that were made for a certain historical moment, using these categories for other historical moments. And I am not sure that using the word fascism today is really appropriate, even if we use it not as a very historical, precise phenomenon, but as a, a kind of family name. Yeah. The people that are involved are not exactly the same. The discourse is not exactly the same. The forms of action are not exactly the same. We could, dis we could find many differences, including the relationship to violence. If I take the French case, I don't want to, to, to generalize too much, but for instance, you cannot say that the National Front is in favor of using violence in order to achieve their goals. You cannot say that. Maybe in other cases, there is a, a more positive, if I can say it like that, relationship to violence. But it is not the case. It is not the case, at least in my country. So there are so many differences that, that we should be more, uh, we should work a little bit more and mm -hmm. create new vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Fascism, the, the, the word was obvious. It became absolutely clear. Today we don't have, and this is my last remark, we don't have the real good vocabulary to deal with this phenomenon. We say populism. We sometimes say national, national populism. We say extremism. We say uh, nationalism. We say, say extremism. But these are not words that are totally satisfying. So we have a problem of language in front of this phenomenon. This would be my, 
my point. So I, I am a little bit like Timothy. I would start from analyzing what is at stake, really, mm -hmm. concretely. What, what are these phenomena? What are these movements? And uh, I would not try to too quickly say, oh, this is fascism. Mm -hmm. This would be my position in this debate. Mm -hmm. Daniel. But uh, granted, and I think it's important to uh, begin with these uh, let's call them definitional anxieties. Um, that said, and I, I'm going to uh, address a couple of points, and then I want to turn to Masha Gessen, who has written very powerfully on, uh, on the phenomenon of a, a kind of resistance to acknowledging the nature of the phenomenon that one is looking at, whatever its name may be. Can we not Granted what, what everyone has said thus far, can we nonetheless establish a, uh, I think it was uh, Timothy Garton Ash who used the word tropes, tropes that we see recurring, which are in common with historical fascist regimes, xenophobia, uh, the, the sort of elevation of myths of national purity, anti-Semitism, uh, um, nativism, uh, the, the fantasy of a original population that is now being threatened by outsiders or traitors from within. Th I would say, and I'm not nearly as much an expert as all of you are, but it seems to me that these are, uh, are all of them traits that we have been seeing rise to the surface once again. And M Masha, here I'm going to turn to you, and I would certainly like to hear a response to what I just said, but Masha has written very powerfully about, uh, among many other things, the way in which when there is an authoritarian figure who can manipulate these tropes, then we're in a, a familiar territory, even though there may not be exact correspondences historically or the, these, the present phenomenon may have arisen out of a different set of constitutive circumstances. But when those tropes are wielded by a powerful authoritarian figure with a, a great demagogic appeal, it seems to me that we're in the same boat, even though the boat might have a different name. Uh, Masha, what are your thoughts? You're muted, I think. Well, what will happen first? I will learn to unmute or the pandemic will end. Um, but um, <clears throat> I mean, like any conversation about language, this becomes a meta conversation because we are, I think in, in the, uh, the, the, the people who have spoken so far have not only advanced, but also illustrated all the arguments for and against using the word fascist, right? Um, in, I'm lucky in a way to be not, an academic, but 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 a journalist, and so I think I think more proportionally about the <clears throat> the utility of using a word than the correctness of using a word. Right? Why would I use it um, here and now um, as opposed to a different term? Um, and so uh, a, a reason not to use the word fascism is exactly what Michelle illustrated, which is that it immediately uh, gets you into an argument about the differences between the current situation and historical situations, which will always be the case, right? Um, no period in history um, is exactly the same as any earlier period, no country, uh, no, um, you know, no, no, no political movement, in one land is exactly the same as a political movement in another land. And I think that's a very strong argument against using um, a word that has been applied so many times to describe so many different things in so many different periods, because it, you risk getting into this argument. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, I think the strongest argument for using the word fascism is and, and particularly in journalism, and this is something that, that, that I've thought about a lot, even though I've done it very little. Uh, and, and I'll talk in a minute about, the, the, I think, the one time that I decided to do it in a New Yorker article. Uh, 
journalism, even though we often call it the first draft of history, is in a way the opposite of history. Uh, journalism has a very strong normalizing um, inertia. We see things and we immediately strive to describe them as though they were exactly as things had always been and always will be. Right? We see something that happens for the first time and in a, in a, in a very sort of a, uh, a historical way, um, act as though this is something that is, that is in no way unusual. This is not a normal way of thinking about journalism, right? We think about journalism as being sensationalist, but if you think about the way sort of coverage of politics uh, is structured, it is structured in exactly that way. It is, it is structured in, in, in a way to communicate to the reader that these things are normal and regular for the simple reason that we're witnessing them. And if we're witnessing them, then they're not isolated events of history. There are not things that, they can, that, that we can define and put behind us um, and sort of say that was a phenomenon that we have described that is different from what we're experiencing now, right? What we're experiencing now is almost by definition in journalism normal. And so a word like fascism or the word fascism has the ability to denormalize the conversation, right? It, has, it carries a lot of risks, but it, but it draws attention to itself. It immediately begs the question, why is this person using this, um, this, this term and is it warranted? Um, and I think sometimes it is, uh, it, it has utility. Um, I chose to use, to use the word fascism when Donald Trump uh, used um, military helicopters and other military force to clear a a square in Washington, D.C. for a um, photo opportunity with the Bible. <clears throat> and um, it was a, an aesthetic move that was so strongly, um, that, that so strongly referenced fascist aesthetics that I thought, okay, this is a moment to point that out. Because any other way of talking about it in journalism would have normalized it. The president of the United States posed for a, a photo in a public square uh, in Washington, D.C. Yep. has a, a, a way of, 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 of sort of communicating that there's nothing to see here. And what I wanted to say was there is something to see here. And this, in fact, is what we're looking at. Yeah. I, sorry, I think uh, uh, Timothy Garton asked wants to say something relative to this. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, perhaps I can come in and um, pick up from where Masha left off and say that I think, Masha, what you just said and what, in a sense, we were saying are entirely compatible in the following way. What we are cautioning against is using fascism as a noun, as a systemic comprehensive description of the system. And that's not only intellectually problematic, as Michelle and Stephanie said, it's also politically problematic because then the defenders of very nasty regimes immediately say, but Donald Trump isn't committing genocide, but Viktor Orban doesn't have concentration camps and so on and so forth. It gives an easy out. But I'm entirely happy and indeed in favor of using the word fascist as an adjective together with a particular noun, fascist rhetoric, fascist tactics, fascist movement post-fascist party, all these things exist. So for example, one I, I care deeply about, which is Hungary. I mean, a, a friend of mine who's a professor at the Central European University said to me just casually when we were talking about why so many people were leaving Hungary, he said, you know, they, they don't want to live in a fascist country. And um, sure, we have to talk about that, but then you have to take it apart. And in the case of Viktor Orban, he has certain fascist traits. So it's the politics of resentment, it's anti-liberalism, it's heavily gendered, male chauvinist, paternalistic, uh, it's the folk, the people against cosmopolitan elites and ethnic others. It has all those features, but what it doesn't have, or only right at the margins, is that really important element, which is political violence, which of course you do have in the US and you do have in Putin's Russia. So it's kind of illuminating if you go at it with the adjective rather than the noun. 
Stephanie? Yes, because I, uh, if I can just jump, sorry, Caroline, but sure. I, I suppose that what was I was saying before that, you know, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, <laughs> at what point do you call it a duck? And I think that I thought Masha's uh, point about the aesthetics of Trumpism as recalling the aesthetics of fascism, the, I, you know, one could have called this panel, how afraid should we be? Maybe. Um, and remember, too, that we're, we're talking about neo-fascism, uh, just to be uh, just to be clear. But uh, again, is it is it useful to establish a, a list of traits, gestures, activities and ideologies that the these governments and movements today have in common with traditional mm -hmm. fascist regimes? in order to get us to the place where we want to be. If I can rephrase the question Daniel is asking now, uh, and I think maybe combine it with something uh, Masha has said, and that is, um, of course, I think one is uh, at least ambiguous about using the term fascism because one does not want to relativize the past and one does not want to relativize uh, the crimes of, of Nazi Germany in particular. Um, and yet, at the same time, with that caution or, or with that sort of strong normative desire to never ever relativize this past and therefore not use ever the term fascism uh, when it's inadequate uh, in correspondence to this past. And I think there's also the risk of somehow assuming fascism is only in the past. There is no continuity. It is a closed historic uh, uh, you know, process or, t or time. And... Um, to put it differently, I'm sometimes really, really worried that, particularly in Germany, the, the I think the, the normative claim of my generation, the nie wieder, the never again, uh, I'm afraid it's somehow unintentionally prevented us from seeing what is there again. Um, and so, so I, I, I do want to take up you know, uh, both Timothy's and, and Daniel's question of can we, you know, can we search for those features or characteristics that we think they have in common or that we now see again, Stephanie and then Michelle. Yeah, thank you. I, I absolutely agree, Caroline, with also the German specificity with the problem of calling fascism fascism or whatever. But I think even if we don't use the term, we take, you know, get away with it. We have still a lot, I mean, a lot of reason to be afraid and to be scared. We, um, you know, just looking at the phenomenon in the, in the present, and I think it also has to do, and, and you mentioned it a bit, Karen, with we are in a kind of trap of teleological thinking of history in the sense that this was 45, it was finished, we defeated it, and not we, actually, but others. Thanks for you. And, um, and then democracy was like, you know, was you know, the idea of political regime that was to be, a, you know, headed to, I mean, that countries were becoming more democratic. And I guess even in, in, in not only in the West, but also in, in the East and in, in, in the global South, you know, this was like, there was a certain idea of democracy, human rights, this is what we have Progress. to achieve. And, um, and this is what we will achieve. And then in 1990, you know, there was this sh very short moment of euphoria which was followed in Germany by the so-called baseball club, baseball club years by like racist murders, like when in in, the, in German streets. So, I think the why should history? I mean, history does not repeat itself. But why do we believe that enlightenment and democracy is like the mo the thing that we will all move to, or that history is moving to? I think this is a wishful thinking. It's, it's almost a childish thinking that I also have, I, but um, it prevents us from mm -hmm. accepting that maybe it's not so. Maybe this phase between 45 and 1990 was the exception, and we are yeah. going back to norm normal. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. I think, yeah, maybe I, I, I stop here, yeah. and I see Michelle wants Michel? to join in. Well, I come from a country, France, which was not considered as having been 
fascist, but we have been Pétainist, which is not so brilliant, that is to say, <laughs> collaboration with Nazism. So today, if there is a revival of something in my country, people, if you say it's fascism, it does not make any connection with our French past. Mm -hmm. The okay. connection with the French past would be, oh, this is Pétainism. Mm -hmm. So this is to say that this is, a, a, this is different from a country to another country. That's my first point. Mm -hmm. My second point is that I can accept the idea of a, a kind of air de famille, family um, resemblance between all these phenomena, and we call, can call this air de famille, we, we can call it fascist, and using the adjective as Timothy uh, suggests, I have no problem with this. The problem is also for me that, that is that uh, this phenomenon have an history. When we say fascism, speaking about Italy, at the very beginning, it is very different from what it was at the very end. It begins with a social movement, with social protest, with marches, with, uh, I have seen one day, I, I, I recommend this, this movie, a movie, Mussolini in Trieste. A big, <coughs> big meeting, you understand what is the relationship between the leader and the movement, you know, thousands and thousands of people and the leader, so, so. But at the very end, it is not like that. It's not this big movement and this big relation with crowds and so on. It's something else. So fascism begins like this, a strong relationship between a leader and a movement. And at the very end, it's war, it's destruction of Jews in Germany or from Germany, it's total dictatorship, and it's something different. Would you call fascist the, uh, Germany in 1940 or in 1941 or 1942? I am not so sure. So this is to say we have to be very careful. And my last point, and I, again, I, I, I join what a certain number of things which have been said. At the very yeah. end, I think that what we should do is to say, look at these different cases in Europe or in, uh, in America or in other parts in the world, look at this. Maybe they are not perfectly fascist. Maybe there are only some resemblance. But don't forget that this leads to exactly. awful results. Yes. So that's the point for me. It's the lesson of history. Are, it begins differently. It means different things. It is different. OK, maybe we should not call it totally fascist. OK, but look, it begins like that. And the end may become what we have seen in Germany, in Japan, or in, in Italy. So I suppose a problem, to come back to something that Masha Gessen said, uh, uh, speaking, Masha, as a journalist, and the points that you made about the, uh, the kind of um, challenges of how to describe these phenomena that you see in a way that doesn't raise, uh, let's call it false alarms, but does signal the seriousness of what you're talking about. So let's maybe try to reframe the issue as a question about, so aware as we are of the historical differences of the specificity of certain kinds of fascism in history, how do we talk about it on a practical level as a journalist? You know, when you see these leaders using the same rhetoric using the same political tricks. Uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk here, for example, when, when Trump uh, kept referring to the press as liars and, you know, fake news. And people said, well, you know, it's just like Hitler and the Lügenpresse. And people said, oh, no, no, it's not like that. And, and you think, well, why isn't it like that? It's the exact same, it's the exact same gesture with the exact same aim. So what? So I guess I want to rephrase this as a question. So what is the right way to write about it, both as scholars, but also as working journalists, if we feel there is cause for alarm? Um, well, that's a simple question to answer. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, Daniel, uh, <laughs> is the answer. Uh, but um, I want to pick up on a couple of things that, that, that um, Timothy and, and, and Stephanie said, and maybe that will be a little helpful in, in sort of making our, our way in this direction. Um, 
I mean, it's amazing, uh, Timothy, what you said about your Hungarian friends, because um, one of the most important conversations of my entire life was when I was, um, I think, 12. And um, my family had applied to emigrate from the Soviet Union. And I asked my mother, uh, why are we leaving? Right? I mean, we had a wonderful life there. We had friends, we had community, we had, um, you know, my parents had intellectual jobs. Why are we leaving? And, um, and my mother said, because we live in a fascist country. And that was mind blowing mm -hmm. because even though I, you know, I was, I was a very smart kid. I was reading Samus Dutt. Can you say was, when that was? Can you, can you give us the year? Uh, this would have been 1979. Um, I was, you know, I was, I had read Solzhenitsyn. I had read uh, Mandelstam at that point. Uh, I was, and, I, and I'm citing those two because I, I sort of was aware of the facts and uh, of, the, of the gulag uh, and Stalinist terror. And I was sort of steeped in the aesthetics of, of resistance to it. And it had never occurred to me to put that term to it, right? Um, we talked about Stalin as Stalin. We talked about post-Stalinism as post-Stalinism. We never talked about it as fascism. And <clears throat> the reason, right, it seemed like an incredibly brave and brilliant thing for my mother to say was that the historiography that we're seeing in um, was that fascism was something unimaginable. Mm -hmm. Not only was it over, not only was it defeated, but it was unimaginable imaginable it was the other side of human right whatever was happening to us in the soviet union was just you know life mm. it was terrible but it was life it wasn't the other side of human and i think that this is where um you know, zygmunt bauman's work on uh, the holocaust which places it as of an expression of a human potentiality that is it is as the most human thing mm that has happened, right, um, is, is so important and so different from the way that we usually talk about the Holocaust and about, and about, and about fascism. And so, um, you know, this, this sort of this difference between the unimaginable and, and, and the lived and, and, and the present. And um, on a related, but I'm not exactly sure how to sort of make this 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 pop. So I'm just going to uh, to, to to switch gears and then try to to, to explain the connection. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about what happens in particular situations when in the United States, uh, public people, particularly women of color, make a reference to the Holocaust, and the whole country goes berserk. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the either explicit, as in the case of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who made the comparison to the uh, to con Nazi concentration camps when she was talking about uh, U.S. immigration detention centers for children who had been separated from their parents. Mm. And all hell broke loose, because how could she make that comparison? Uh, and then just the, the other day, Whoopi Goldberg, the comedian, um, said something um, ignorant, but also kind of understandable about the Holocaust. Um, in sort of understandable in the in the, in the, in the uh, American understanding of, of of race politics, and all hell broke loose. And she, you know, she apologized immediately. She was suspended by ABC News. And I think there's a particular uh, fear of people who are in a position to talk about the, uh, the uh, to talk about white supremacist politics in the United States uttering anything that has to do mm. with uh, with Nazi Germany because that makes that connection between mm. the lived and the unimaginable possible that in no way answers your question Daniel but uh, mm -hmm. but I hope it advances the conversation Timothy yeah um since Masha, about the time Masha was hearing that from her mother, I was actually having lunch with a fascist in 1978, a real fascist, um, the former leader of the British Union of Fascists, Sir Oswald Mosley. Uh, in his villa outside Paris, there were still real capital F fascists around at that time. 
and in the middle of lunch, he delivered himself of the following sentence in very bad French. Nous disons que le marxisme est totalement fini. We're saying that Marxism is totally finished. And I thought at that time how absurd, because of course Marxism is still very much alive, but fascism is dead. Mm -hmm. So our experience in Western Europe was, Marsha, this is something completely unimaginable here. Communism is really alive. That's a serious threat. But it's absolutely dead. And now we're quite rightly talking about fascism, like my Hungarian friends and many others. Mm. But I have to say, when I then sat down with my Hungarian friends and said, do you think Viktor Orban's regime is actually fascism? The answer was no. It has fascist traits. It has fascist elements. It's bad enough, but it's not actually fascism. And w one element of that is... So, so I was talking to a really brave investigative journalist in Budapest from an outfit called Direct 36, which has been exposing the Orban regime's corruption and so on. A great guy. And I said to him, hey, look, aren't you afraid of being beaten up in a dark alley? Aren't you afraid of something happening? That's what happens to journalists in nasty places. And he said, no, no, absolutely not. Actually, absolutely not. And then he said, and you know, we're in the EU. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, Daniel, we're talking about all the similarities. There are a lot of similarities. Yeah. Also between, say, Orban and Putin mm -hmm. or Le Pen and Trump. But there's one really big difference, which is about not only the glorification of violence, of martial virtue, what used to be called bellicism, but actual political violence. I mean, you in the United States have chronic endemic political violence. Putin, well, Masha has written brilliantly about this. It is actual political violence. Um, but are European regimes with fascist traits, I'd put it that way, are nasty enough, um, but on the whole, so far, without that really important and dangerous feature? Could I... Uh, could I... Um asked um, both Michelle and Stephanie taking something up that Masha said. For me, re it was really, really helpful, the answer that you thought wasn't an answer to Daniel's question about uh, the unimaginable and the lived. Um, and here's why. Um, I would say that the last um, five years at least, probably the last 10 years, was a succession of moments, both in the US uh, and in Europe, where I said, this is, unima this is unimaginable. I mean, this is, this is right. beyond anything uh, I, I ever thought that I would witness in <coughs> my lifetime. And I remember when you, Masha, uh, wrote the text, um, I think in the New York Review of Books also, Autocracy Rules for Survival, uh, right after the Trump election. I remember reading this and thinking, this is unimaginable. I mean, there's someone who's already now uh, describing to us uh, how, how we can possibly survive. And so I think it's really, really helpful to, to use uh, the ideas of, of the unimaginable that has suddenly become something that we live through to think about the current events, whether we call this fascism or not, you know, let, let, let's take that aside for a moment. But if we look at the situation in France, and Michelle would like you to reflect on that, and the one in Germany, um, if we look at we call them right radical, we call them authoritarian or ethno-nationalistic. I, I, I'm curious from you, Michelle, how you would describe uh, this last period um, as something that was unimaginable to you before? I am sure it was in not, uh, un that it was unimaginable because if I have been asked two years ago about, for instance, Eric Zemmour, the new candidate which is having 10 or 20 or, or 12 or, or 13 percent of public support in the opinion, I would never have imagined this. So 
It is true we are in a, in a world where things, we don't imagine what things are going to be, and we are not in a world where you can make any serious prediction, which makes future very difficult to think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I fully agree. I would like also to come back because things were different after the Second World War when discussing fascism. I was thinking, listening to Masha and listening, well, to, to, to everybody here, I was thinking uh, in the 70s, the big debate was, was not between fascism and or not. It was between fascism, it was between two or not different totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. It was an Arendt uh, position. In my country, people, we, we, we had a very solid communist and Marxist tradition. Nobody, almost nobody wanted to listen to Anna Arendt because she was saying fascism and Stalinism are two totalitarianism. And it was very difficult in France to understand what Stalinist scene was saying. It was a big, big debate. So my point is that at, there was a moment when the debate about what we are calling today fascism was with an adversary or with an enemy. Mm -hmm. Soviet Union, Marxism, communism, and, and so on. Today, today, fascism does not have such a strong enemy. Or if there is an enemy, we could call it democracy, from my point of view. And so things are very different. The, the way we built the debate is very, very uh, different. And this is maybe why things are not, we cannot imagine. When we have a kind of war between two totalitarianism, we can imagine mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, James Bond or whatever. I mean, we can imagine many things. But today, those people are destroying democracy. And if democracy is destroyed, we don't know. Could you describe, yeah. for those who don't know the situation in France that well, could you describe a little bit the, the current right radical scene or the, or the different kinds of, let's say, uh, Oh, well, I will try to do it in, 30, in 30 seconds, which no. is not so easy. So, but I will try. You can have much more than One minute, seconds. maybe. So, in France, like in many other parts of the world, we have a crisis of, represent, of political representation. The political system is totally defeated. So, what we have today is extreme left, we have a kind of populist extreme left, which is called La France Insoumise. The leader is called Jean-Luc Mélenchon. This is maybe 10% of the voters. Then, almost nothing. We don't have any serious, uh, predictable, uh, to speak like that, left in my country today. The Socialist Party does not exist anymore. The Communist Party does not exist anymore. So you have extreme left, then almost nothing, then the president, Emmanuel Macron, with center right, to speak very quickly. Then you have a classical right, which is not in a good state, but which is not totally defeated. And then we have two important expressions of what we can call extreme right. On the one hand, what, what, what can be called now the classical extreme right with Marine Le Pen, and a party which was called the National Front, that changed the name, but let us say National Front. So, which is, which tries to be very respectable, which, for instance, they never accepted violence in name of their pr program, never. So, that's on one side. And then an outsider, whose name is Eric Zemmour, he was a very well, he is a very well-known journalist, so you have also Awful journalist, Masha, not only good ones. <laughs> so he is a very uh, writing in the right, in the very rightist and extreme right mm, uh, media, and with the support of a very important TV channel, which is a little bit like, like Fox in the state. So we have today two important forces on the extreme right. Marine Le Pen tries to be more and more respectable. Mm -hmm. And, and Eric Zemmour is, it's a very complex situation. On the one hand, at the right of Marine Le Pen, with some uh, neo-Nazi people in his uh, political uh, sphere and so on. And on the other hand, saying, I am the one that can talk with the classical right. Oh. So, so, extreme right, nothing. I exaggerate <laughs> a little bit. Extreme right, nothing. 
Macron, classical right, a little bit, and two extreme forces at the extreme right. Mm -hmm. That's the situation in my country, three months before a presidential election, which will be followed immediately by uh, uh, legislative elections mm -hmm. for the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, Stéphane, do you also, the question that I, that I asked to, to Michel about the unimaginable and, and, and the lived, how would you describe the context here uh, with regard to, to how often did you think this is unimaginable, what is happening, and um, how would you describe the development of the right extreme scene, whether we, you know, independent of the question whether we call it fascist or not? Well, I think the situation in Germany is a bit different also compared to Hungary or, or Poland, where we can watch like the conscious destruction of democracy and of the state of law step by step by a powerful and democratically elected government, which is a, a complete difference. And here in Germany, we also have a democratically elected government and uh, we have uh, a right-wing, extremely right-wing party in this parliament, which was a certain moment of I, it was expected, but not maybe in the size. But of course, as, as um, Michel said, it's, not, it's a party that does not um, call for violence. It's a democratic party. I mean, a party that uses democratic means of being a political party in parliament, etc. But at the same time, what we, do have, what we have here is a mass mobilization in the streets. And this has been going on for 10 years now even more than 10 years. It started with these demonstrations, Monday demonstrations. Then we had Pegida, which was anti-Muslim mass demonstrations, and really massive demonstrations. Then we had 2015, the humanitarian crisis, as our new Minister of Interior calls it, thankfully. And, and now we have corona demonstrations almost every day. So there is a mobilization on the street. And of course, we all know there is even much, much more mass mobilization in the social media, which is turning more and more violent in the social, on the web and also on the streets. I mean, you can see how this is becoming worse and worse and, more, and there are death threats to politicians and uh, you know, people who are engaged in politics or from the civil society, et cetera, et cetera. But my moment of disbelief and deep, deep frustration was after, I mean, the killing, the murder of Walter Lübcke, this politician in the country of Hessen who was killed by a right-wing radical or terrorist or what, however we want to call him because he had been friendly to refugees in 2015 and there had been threats against him and then he was killed kind of cold-blooded on his um, terrace in front of his home. And what was, I mean, this murder was frightening but what was for me was unbelievable that when it was when after it was clear you know what was the background of of the murderer i thought there would be demonstrations in the street and since i'm not on twitter and not on facebook you know i tried to find out where is the demonstration how where can i go and there was nothing there was and i was stunned there was a very tiny very radical left wing group who called for a, a manwache kind of commemoration or whatever um, demonstration in front of the AFD headquarters. So I went there, there were 20 people, there were 20 policemen, and there were like 10 or 15 AFD people who were like laughing and having a great time. And, uh, and this feeling of utter helplessness of being like 20, I mean, so where were the others, you know? Um, I was stunned and I was frustrated and also scared. Because One should this also is, say that he was, yeah. Lübke, but Lübke was, a, was a member of the party of the Christ, uh, CDU or the Christian Democratic Union, so the party of Angela Merkel. So, so to, to see Nothing. The, the, the vacuum, yeah, to, to, exactly. to see that there was no, mourn, no idea of mourning somebody who was you know, within that party was yeah. murdered by a right extreme terrorist was, was, I agree, I mean, shocking. Yeah, and, and I mean, we have been used to racist murders. I mean, as I said, in the 1990s and lately again, but this was, um, if I remember correctly, the first time that a politician, you know, an acting politician was killed by a right-wing terrorist and nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. So, 
if this is the resilient forces in this country, you know, I do, I am worried. It, it seems to me uh, what you're saying uh, just now brings us back to an issue that Timothy Gartnash raised about political violence being a, a, a uh, distinguishing factor between historical kinds of fascism, certain kinds of fascism in Europe, what's going on in the United States, which is anyway a very violent country. But I want to somehow connect uh, thoughts about political violence as an element of the mix that we're interested in and Masha's concept, which I think is very useful of the unimaginable. So some of you may be aware that uh, just two days ago, the Republican National Committee uh, which is the highest governing body of one of the two major political parties in this country, has officially declared that the deadly, murderous political violence that took place at the United States Capitol on January 6th last year was a legitimate form of political discourse. And this seems to me to combine two of the elements we've just been hearing about. One, about when political violence becomes uh, part of the the mix, and also the unimaginable, because I have to say I'm rapidly exhausting my capacity for un unimagining, so to speak, <laughs> but uh, uh, that was a real shocker, you know, that, which is to say that violent, illegal, illegal violence has now been approved and normalized by one of our two major political parties. So I'd like to hear uh, from everybody, really, about what... When does political violence historically enter A? When does political violence enter into the equation? And what are the circumstances traditionally? And also the radicalization of traditional conservative parties seems to be an important element it, it, historically. And I, I would like to hear more about that. But uh, if, if you don't mind, Masha, I'd like to start with you and your reaction to that recent news from the Republican National Committee and how it fits into your vision of what's going on. Um, I'm sorry, Daniel, were you addressing me or Timothy? I, you had just- uh, No, you, I, I, you, oh, I was me. just interested in your reaction to the RNC news. Right, um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, K uh, Carolyn um, mentioned the piece that I wrote right after the election called um, Autocracy Rules for Survival <clears throat> and Timothy Snyder, who I think is um, on an, another panel uh, in, in the series of events, um, read that and wrote a kind of response or um, uh, continuation, um, which later turned into his book, Poignant Lessons from the 20th Century on Tyranny. And one of the uh, points in there was, um, I think watch out or beware of um, paramilitary uh, units. And I remember reading that in the, so this was spring 2017 yeah. when I was reading his, his book in galleys and I, and I thought, okay, well, this seems unimaginable. This seems going a little overboard. Come on. I mean, I, I understand Tim that you're a historian, you know, but, but really, uh, and of course, I've, I've mentally, I mean, I did not express that to, to, to him at the time, and I've mentally apologized to him uh, many times since, <laughs> most, most especially on January 6th of last year, and then two days ago again. Right? Um, he was exactly right. This was a thing to, to watch out for. <clears throat> it happened much faster than uh, anyone, I think, could have imagined. Uh, I, did, I didn't imagine it happening at all. <clears throat> And this is, at this point, I mean, I, um, I think um, I got used to thinking when I was still living in Russia and reporting on Russian politics, I got used to thinking of things as shocking but not surprising because you yeah. see something that is absolutely part of the logic of events, you could have predicted it. And yet when it happens, um, you feel struck by lightning. Yeah. And that is exactly my reaction to the to the RNC news. 
the logic of events, the logic of the Republican Party turning into an autocratic party, turning into a party with an audience of one person and, uh, by the name of Donald Trump, um, which I think is, is, is the definition of the, an autocratic party that I've been using, <clears throat> sort of a party that addresses itself to the autocrat rather than to voters or some group of voters. Um, and um, so the logic of the Republican Party turning into an autocratic party would dictate this kind of legitimation of the events of January 6th in particular and political violence in general. And yet, when it happened, I couldn't believe it was happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Timothy, you want it? Yeah, um, the Polish writer Stanislaw Letz once said, I thought we'd reach bottom, and then I heard knocking from underneath. And that's what it's been like for the last 10 years. We thought we reached bottom, and then we had knocking from underneath. I want to say something slightly different, which connects to this, which is I, I think we have to watch out for the picture that automatically comes into our minds when we talk about fascist or fascism of a kind of downward path mm -hmm. of a descent into the swamp and into yeah. hell. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Snyder, my good friend, had a great line, post-truth is pre-fascism. Now, it's a brilliant line, but what it suggests is that what is worst about post-truth is that it's a prelude to something even worse, which is fascism, that we'll go on down. And actually, it seems to me that in Europe, and I think here, we are still different from Russia and the United States, mm. is that actually these fascist tropes, Daniel, these fascist elements may not lead us to full-blooded fascism with mass political violence and all the worst horrors, but they may, may lead us to something which is very bad, which is, um, I would say, hyper-polarized post-truth politics, a kind of hybrid regime in which exploits mass democracy, which, by the way, is a, is a feature of, of, of historical fascism. Historical fascism is a perversion of mass democracy. Sure. It, it exploits mass democracy to set it against liberalism, right? So you have a stable state, which is very bad, post-truth, hyperpolarized politics. Um, its victim is liberalism, but it's not the full dress fascism. <clears throat> but and that is what I see happening in Europe at the moment, and, uh, and, and that's bad enough in itself. But if we look at, um, I mean, it's one, it, it seems to be one distinction to say in Russia and in the US we have uh, yet another uh, danger or, 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 you know, a lack of institutional maybe resilience or resistance. Um, yet, um, if I look at uh, what's been leading up to this, if we look at the Republican Party, for example, we would say there is, I mean, you could either argue, you know, a, a, a dissolution of the uh, Republican Party, or you could say there's a radicalization of the Republican Party and a failure of conservatism that led to the situation. But if I look at um, the UK, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Timothy, but I would say, isn't there also sort of a radicalization of ultra-liberalism that led to the current situation? A radicalization of ultra-liberalism. Tell yes. me <laughs> who you have in mind. I mean, Boris Johnson seems to me a radicalization of far, but not a radicalization of... The radicalization of, of what? Far. Fun. Farce. Ah. Far. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> well, no. I, well, I mean, I was just wondering. I mean, you, you would, you would not. In, in the UK, it seems there was such a, um, I would say, radical concept of free market, of deregulation, of privatization. I mean, from Thatcher on, uh, that I'm, I'm curious how you would assess what I would describe as a subversion of sort of also the social fabric um, 
of society, of the welfare state, of um, yeah, the the understanding of um, I would say res publica, and that's what I would describe a radicalization of an sort of an ultra liberalism. Um, I would reject the term ultra liberalism. Okay. I think it's a perversion of liberalism. Uh, okay. It's self evidently the case that quote unquote. Thatcherite neoliberalism, market fundamentalism, brutal globalized financialized capitalism had a terrible social impact in Britain and is therefore one of the causes of the Brexit vote. That's that's obviously the case. Um, and but but our government now has no ideological coherence. Some of its policies, the leveling up policies, I regard as in themselves highly desirable. It's precisely what we need mm -hmm. to level mm -hmm. up to the neglected other half of our society. Other parts of the Conservative Party are still clinging to Thatcherism. So it's, it's actually all over the place. But what I would say, because I think this is sometimes misunderstood in Germany, so let me just say it, <clears throat> is that while it's dreadful and farcical, on the whole, the institutions of liberal democracy have held in the United Kingdom. When Boris Johnson tried to prorogue parliament, suspend parliament for five weeks at a crucial moment, he was completely overruled by the Supreme Court, doesn't happen so much in the US, and that judgment was immediately accepted. We still have the BBC. Politicians small sides still meet and have a civilized debate on the BBC. So there are certain features that have actually held in Britain and actually distinguish it from the kind of hyper-polarized post-truth politics that I'm afraid you have in the United States or indeed in, in a country like Poland. Mm -hmm. Michel. I would like to come back to this issue of political violence. Yes, there are some differences at the present time between Europe and, to, to say it very quickly, uh, North America and uh, Russia, for instance. This is clear. But there are also differences in time as far as just Europe is at stake. Uh, and here I have to be a little bit more precise. With uh, Nazism, the, the movement was walking on two legs. On the one leg, violence, and on the other uh, leg, uh, being elected. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a kind of a double uh, process. Today, if I look at European uh, extreme right movements, Either they are strong and they don't use violence, that's my first point, either they are weak, very weak, and they use violence. The stronger they are, the less violent they will be. This is what I've seen. For instance, in Greece, you had a very weak uh, extreme right movement, a golden something, I don't remember the English Go word. On. Yeah, so uh, they, were, they, were, they are violent, they are weak. So, my, this is my first point, but there is a second point which is much more important. I don't know if it is true for other countries, but in my country, during 30 or 40 years, political violence was almost totally illegitim, not legitimate. It was not acceptable. In the 60s, in the 70s, yes, <laughs> Marxist, revolutionary, and so on, uh, m maybe you remember Jean-Paul Sartre, writing terrible things about decolonization, using violence, and so on. So, but after that, during 30 or 40 years, there was no room for legitimacy of violence. And then violence, political violence is coming back, at least in my country, but not where we expect it, not from the extreme right, much more from two other sources. On the one hand, les gilets jaunes, yellow jackets, and, with the, and the violence which was coming with yellow jacket was extreme left violence. Ultra, you, we call it ultra left mm -hmm. on the one hand, and on the second hand, police uh, excesses. The, the, the way the government used the police in order to finish with uh, uh, protest by the yellow jacket was also full of non-legitimate violence. Mm -hmm. I have no time to be more precise. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say, is that when we deal with this idea of political violence, fascist, and so on, in a, f in a situation just like the situation in France, we must understand that political violence is not where we expect it 
necessarily to be, and maybe in other parts of the political or social uh, spectrum. It's interesting because here I would say the, <coughs> what has trans the transformation of the of the scene of the radical right that we witnessed in the past 10 years or 15 years, Stephanie, correct me if, if I'm wrong, I would say was that we used to have, or, uh, you know, there's sort of a more intellectual scene of writers, publishers uh, on the extreme right. There is a scene of sort of hardcore hooligans, comrade scenes, people who are willing and ready to commit, you know, racist or anti-Semitic uh, attacks uh, and, and who want to use political violence and a political representation of a party, mm. uh, you know, that tries to reach uh, uh, representation in the parliament. And I would say that in the 90s, these scenes were not strongly connected or not so strong connected as nowadays. I would say that is one of the major differences that I at least perceive about the German radical right is that suddenly you have a connection between these groups, which is why I think to search for political violence as a marker of the extreme right is somehow inadequate because I would say, of course, the political party does not call for political violence. It doesn't even need to, because the texture and the structure of the entire scene is such that it's enough to have, I would say, social media militia calling for <laughs> violence. But you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I like this expression, social media militia. I think that's exactly what we are having and what we are seeing. Um, and I think the AFD in Germany is very smartly flirting with violence. I mean, of course, it's a democratic party and no blah, 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 but in the background, there's always, I mean, especially Höcke is very clever and very successful in hinting at the possibility of something worse will happen if this small, poor Germany is not being, you know, allowed to live up again to its former great and so on. So he has this victim mein liebes kleines Deutschland, whatever, this kind of almost childish talk, which is, I mean, it gives me the creeps, I must say, which is hiding a bigger threat. And he is playing with this very, very smartfully, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, I, I must say, as I said with Lübcke, it works. I mean, I do feel threatened, but I think we shouldn't be so, we should be more courageous in a sense of not, being, you know, and this is maybe also the term fascism or not fascism, of letting ourselves be so intimidated by these theater performances that we watch. I think what is much more important is to look at the day-to-day -day racist violence in this country, which is there, and to look at what is going on on social media and on the, you know, complete um, explosion of language in a, in a violent and fascist, and there I would say fascist sense. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to contrast the European and the American situation because clearly we're in a very different place here. <clears throat> and it seems to be accelerating, uh, you know, and of course, when, the, when one of your two major political parties actively endorses political violence, in the service of its ideological goals, we're in a very different place at this point. Because, and we obviously before January 6, we had other expressions of political violence during the Trump presidency, which were also deadly. Charlottesville, um, for example. So, I, I I hear what everyone is saying, but I, I, I suspect Masha, you'll agree with me that we seem to be on a different different evolutionary track here at this point, um, which is very alarming to us. And again, it you know, brings me back to this joke I made before, which is maybe we should have just called this panel, how afraid should we be? Um, <laughs> you know. Um, be afraid, be, be very afraid. Um, you know, I mean, I'm wondering uh, how, whether we're over, 
emphasizing the role of political violence. It, <clears throat> and I, I realize this is a very odd thing to, to, to say, but, you know, um, so if we're talking about definitions and, 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 <clears throat> and also how afraid should we be, there's, a, um, there's something that I think we learn from looking at, um, at Soviet totalitarianism, right, which was much longer lived than, uh, than German totalitarianism. And that is that an economy of violence is possible. Um, that, um, that actual terror, actual widespread violence is, um, you know, in the Soviet case, I think it was, it was necessary for the establishment of a totalitarian state. And then it could maintain itself through no violence. I mean, that's what um, Václav Havel's uh, exploration in the power of the powerless is largely about, right? He's asking, he, he called that regime post-totalitarian, but he calls it post-totalitarian largely because it's not violent, right? Um, the, mm -hmm. you know, his, his, his uh, protagonist, imaginary protagonist, the greengrocer, um, is somebody who isn't risking life or limb by if you if you were to disobey, but still doesn't disobey, right? And that's really what he's what he's looking at, and that as I'm trying trying to parse out. Um, but you could rephrase that question, right? You could uh, you could ask, you know, uh, how essential was violence to the maintenance of these regimes? And at a certain point, it wasn't. It was perhaps the credible threat of violence. Um, it was uh, it was maybe the the specter the the very you know the potential of violence not even the credible threat right um, but um, but still you could have an extreme economy of violence and and have a regime so <clears throat> a totalitarian regime so I don't know I mean obviously uh, the political violence is horrible and uh, and every political death is. Um, in its own way, unimaginable. But I don't know that it's a meaningful distinction between kinds of movements and 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 sort of the political the, the stages of political evolution that we're discussing. But listen, if we're talking about political violence, we can't finish this discussion without reminding ourselves that the regime in the world, which, in my view, could most nearly be described as fascist, namely Putin's in Russia, has more than 100,000 troops on the frontiers mm. of a European country, Ukraine, uh, threatening to invade that country, by the way, with the justification that these are Ukrainian fascists. So it's not just political violence, Carolyn, in the small scale. Mm. It is uh, the glorification of war, bellicism, and the readiness to use violence and military force as a means of politics. And that's a challenge, you might call it a fascist challenge, we actually face right now in Europe. So, you know, if we're thinking of conclusions from this panel, you know, one of the things we need to do is to deter Vladimir Putin uh, from invading Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Masha, do you want to... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, no, no. I was just uh, that was that was a deep sigh. I I I, I just I, I'm just back from Ukraine actually this week, and uh, I mean, yes, it would be lovely to deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine, but um, but I don't know that it's possible. And um, <clears throat> uh, so and I think you think the, he will? I, I, I'm not. I mean. I don't think anything on that score. I think that um, uh, I think only he knows. Well, and he may not know right now whether he will or not. Um, I think that the, it's it's one of those inevitable logic phenomena where the threat, uh, the plausible threat of invading Ukraine, has become essential to his regime. Sooner or later, he's going to make good on that threat. Is he going to make it on that thread in the next weeks or months? I have no idea. And, you know, I'm not at all convinced that that's going to happen. Uh, but considering sort of the inexorable nature of it at this point, um, it's going to happen eventually. And I think the deterrence is 
uh, is a very difficult question because I think the usual tools of deterrence are not going to be effective. No, but let's be clear. Let's be clear. Just to look, see, we certainly have to try. You would agree on that, I'm sure, Masha. We should try. Yeah, you'll give me that. <laughs> so, you know, you're sitting, Carolyn, in a country which, partly in the name of the fascist past, is saying not only will we supply, we not supply defensive weapons to Ukraine, which I can understand, but Estonia can't send defensive weapons to Ukraine because they were produced in East Germany. And not only that, but we're not even going to say in words of one syllable clearly that Nord Stream 2 is dead if um, they, Russia invades. So, you know, if we're talking about Verit and Anfangen and how we actually prevent a fascist move, I think we need, at least need to put that on the table. I agree. Could, could we, Daniel, if you, if, if you agree with me, I think it would be good to have a, to have a round on uh, comments from everyone on the tools or instruments of opposition, the, the, the tools and instruments of yeah. resilience, the tools and instruments of resistance. Uh, you know, uh, maybe we start with Stephanie and then we mm. ask all the others. Well, <clears throat> I would join Masha in the deep sigh, thinking about all this, and not only Ukraine, but everything. Um, I think history can be a tool in order to compare, as we said, traits, even no matter what we call them, but I think the, com the, the similarities we see are bad enough, even if we call them dif by different names. And I think we, at the same time, we maybe I'm not talking about myself, one shouldn't be so much um, influenced by historical knowledge in order not to be too intimidated. Mm -hmm. I think this, I see that this has the effect on me of being like, um, you know, almost um, shell-shocked when I see Mr. Höcke and his torches, but maybe just see him as a clown instead of being, you know, having all these historical resonances. So, I, and, and I think to, to have this, we need to have this equilibrium between those two poles uh, as far as inner resilience is concerned. And, and, and the rest is very simple and very boring. Defend democracy and defend the state of law and free media. And I think with the three things, we already would, uh, you know, have a lot. <laughs> Sure. First of all, I am happy that we consider that fascism is not only a domestic issue, it's also a geopolitical issue, and this is very, very important for what we've been discussing. My second point is that, I don't, I, of course, we must not accept fascism, but the solution is not a technical solution. There is not just one tool or several tools just like that. I think, I believe that things will change when we have stronger social and cultural movements in our societies. Today we see the working class movement very weak, not everywhere, but much weaker everywhere than what it was before. And we don't see with so much strength the new cultural, ethical movements, gender, race, human rights, and all these movements. I think that we shall have less fascism when these movements are stronger so they need more support from journalists, from intellectuals, from uh, social scientists, and so on. But this will take time. But the main answer to fascist words and to fascist practices is to have something to oppose to this. And for me, it can only come from the, let us say, the civil society. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Well, I, I, I feel that you know, it's it's easy to talk about these, you know, what we can do to combat. Um, I think, uh, actually, maybe this is a good way to end, but it, certainly in our next panel, which is specifically about demagogy um, and uh, the problems of uh, demagogy, I think will help us to address some of these questions about why people uh, become enthralled with these kinds of uh, authoritarian figures, because I think, you know, of course we can say, well, we have to resist and we have to strengthen uh, social fabrics and all of this, and I certainly believe that, but 
there's a question hovering over this discussion, which, as I said, I think we'll be dealing with straight on in our next uh, conversation, which is why these people, <clears throat> excuse me, are able to rise to the top to begin with, which I think we really need to be talking about. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to that conversation, but, uh, you know, we could all say, well, yes, we know what the problems are and we know how to fix them um, on paper, so to speak. But, but there are obviously deep sociological currents at work here that have allowed these political situations uh, to arise in the way that they have done and, and we'll continue to discuss those. <clears throat> yeah. Uh... Thanks very, very much, uh, Timothy Garden Ash uh, in Oxford. Thanks very, very much, Masha. I assume you are in New York, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Stephanie schuler and Michelle Bjorka here in Berlin in the Schaubühne. Thanks, everybody here in the audience. Uh, and thanks very much, everybody who's been watching on the stream. Uh, we'll be back with a topic Daniel just mentioned in, I think, exactly an hour. Um, an hour. So please... Uh, Join us then. Uh, we'll be back. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.